project, huh? It is. Well, you got it. Go to those Gordian knots or whatever you call them. Yeah. They said it in the first day. It's like, I don't have a dog in the fight. Whatever, but it's easy to prevent that person. It's getting to the point where I assume you're going to go into accident. You haven't got some of that, but it's just, yeah. You can leave it go and see what happens. So let's see what you can do. Yeah. Uh, what else should you do? Uh, those of us that drive food a lot, we kind of got mad. Well, the good news to locals, and I used to drive, you know, from the office up to the rec center and park on third or fourth every day. Yep, I'm avoiding that. Left turn. You bet. I never go on that. It's not going to do anything. Locals will just keep doing that. They'll get the towners. Somebody's going to get hit or something. Is it a week for that? Yeah, well, I'll hear what you have to say. I mean, whatever I've been doing. Yeah, so, so hey, you, you know what that, that's worth, right? Yeah. We got some of the birds, right? <laughs> <laughs> Starting off and then uh, introducing everybody. Everybody Thank you. 
Nice. <laughs> 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 Yes. 
Are you
I'll have you introduce Mark. <laughs> okay, everybody, we're going to go ahead and get started. Can y'all hear me? My name is Clancy Nixon. I'm a community engagement specialist uh, for the city of Durango. If y'all can come up and take a seat, we're going to go ahead and get started with our presentation. Before I get too far into things, I did want to introduce somebody in the room. We have Olivia De Pablo with us. Um, the city is putting effort into language justice and making sure that all of our community members are able to attend these meetings, whether or not English is their first language. And so I just want to introduce Olivia, who is our interpreter tonight, um, so she can say a little something uh, regarding those efforts. Thank you. Yeah, good evening, everybody. My name is Samuela Barrio, and I am the local language justice coordinator on the Nella Plata Framework Coalition. It is an honor to be here. And I want to thank the city of Durango for allowing us to open the spaces, providing us accessibility. Maybe we don't have anybody here. Today, if somebody needs interpretation, just let me know, and I'll be happy to provide you with that equipment. Uh, but even if we don't have anybody here, the community needs some people in the community speak Spanish and other languages. And I think we celebrate the fact that the city is allowing this to make happen. So if we build it, then we'll come in the future. Now, I'm going to repeat the same thing in Espanol. Muchas gracias por dejarnos estar aquí y por permitir hablar el idioma del corazón y por poder abrir espacios multilinguales so we can be able to speak the language of the night. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. Okay. We are here for the Midtown Safety and Connectivity Project. Um, who out of this room has already found that project on our, on our Engage Durango website? Who visited that? Okay. So we have a new website, Engage Durango. Um, you can go to engage.durangoco.gov. We'll put this presentation up as soon as possible. Um, these presentation slides, the recording, all that fun stuff. Um, so you have all of this um, at your disposal, at your fingertips. Um, and then we'll also, we're going to poll you tonight, but we'll also put the poll on that page um, once we're finished up tonight. So just wanted to point you in that direction. At the end of the evening, um, we also have a survey asking you how you think we did, the city, um, in this presentation and in this public meeting. We're really trying to give our best effort to getting community feedback. And so that survey takes about five minutes or less. If you could take the time to scan that QR code on your way out and give us that feedback, it really, really helps us tailor the experience to what uh, means the most to all of you. So thank you all for being here. I'm going to turn it over to Devin and he'll take it away. Thank you, Clancy. All right. Um, well, I'll start off with introducing the whole team. So my name is Devin King. I'm the multi-ball manager for the city of Durango and the project manager for this project. And we are working with SEH. Um, short Elliot Henriksen is our uh, consultant. And Steve Winters is the project engineer and manager on their side. We also have Jeff here, Nathan, who is also an engineer. Uh, Keith Doherty with the city is here, who is the city engineer. Um, and then in the back, we have Sarah Hill, who is the Transportation Department Director. We have Bob Bramer, who is Assistant City Manager, and Tommy Crosby, who is the Community Development Department, who is also helping this evening. So we have a crew of folks here to help you out um, if you have any questions or any, any assistance with anything. And I guess starting off with that, uh, for everybody that doesn't know the space very well, there are bathrooms right out here in the hallway on the right. We also have snacks and some drinks over here if you get hungry or need something to sip on. And we will, with that, get started. So, a uh, quick meeting agenda for you. We are going to start off with going through the background, uh, need, and scope of this project. And so, we've broken up this project into two main components. So, 
We're calling one the Second Avenue corridor, and that includes 13th, 14th, 15th, and East Second Avenue, and those design improvements that we are doing. So we'll present through that first, and then we will do a question and answer period, which Clancy will moderate. And then we will start talking about the alternatives for the 15th Florida and third intersection, and we will have a question and answer portion after that. And then at the very end, we will um, discuss what's next, and then we will have an open house breakout, which I was glad to see that some of you have already been scoping out some of the maps and pictures in the back, which we hope to get more comments from you all back there. So with that, uh, the goal of tonight's meeting is um, to inform you all and show you what, what the 60% design looks like. You know, we've been working hard, um, meeting with several property owners and businesses in the area over the past couple of years. Uh, we've also done some traffic study work, and we've worked with CDOT, and we've worked with DMAD, and, you know, I've been doing a lot of late work. And then we had, uh, back in May of last year, we had a conceptual design meeting. Um, that I know that some of this room were attending, and so we gleaned a lot of information from that, and we will kind of discuss all of that a little more detail here in a little bit. But then, uh, what we're looking for is feedback on minor adjustments to the second half corridor plan, and then getting feedback on everybody's preference for the treatment of the 40 to 15 third avenue intersection. So I'll go through the background and timeline. Like I said, we've been working on this for a while. So um, designs were originally called out in the 2016 multi-wall transportation plan. So for those that don't know, the city first came out with the multi-wall transportation plan in 2012. And that plan is specifically uh, bringing about just the fact that all of our roads are designed for car cars currently. Um, and how do we make space for everybody, all modes of travel? So that includes bicyclists, pedestrians, transit, and then also, how do we make sure everybody's safe on those roadways? So that's really the goal of the multi-level transportation plan, and that's what it really outlines. So in the 2016 version, there are improvements identified to what we have now termed Midtown. Um, and in 2019, it was prioritized by the then multi-level advisory board. So they made a recommendation to city council um, for prioritization of this project. And then in 2020 and in 2021, uh, funds were budgeted by city council for this design project. So in 2021, we contracted the project with SEH. So we went out to bid for that process. SEH was awarded that contract. And then in 2022, we started the traffic study, which we coordinated with CDOT. So for those that don't know, um, CDOT has been, uh, you know, if you saw, the medians that were put in on Camino, they have what's called an access control plan for Camino Del Rio. What that is, is, it is controlling access points onto the highway. And part of that access control plan also had improvements to the 14th main and Camino intersection. And so that's why we coordinated with them on that because it, it's definitely affected by anything going on within this project scope area. So that wrapped up um at i believe the end of 2022 and then we started meeting with property owners and kind of getting feedback on the, you know different improvements and needs of property owners uh, throughout that area and then in 2023 we had a conceptual design and then we had that meeting in may of 2023 to talk about that conceptual design and to receive a lot of feedback so I'll just go ahead and explain this. I've been explaining this a little bit more, but what we mean by conceptual design, usually we have multiple alternatives at that point. There's not any hard engineering into the design. Um, so there's a lot of room for changes and looking at things a little bit differently. When we get to the 60% design, uh, usually there's not any alternatives, but in this case, we have an alternative for the intersection. Um, but a lot more engineering has been done. So drainage has been looked at, um, you know, different aspects. Uh, materials and things like that have been figured out and uh, the line work is a little more precise so at that point changes where we are now um, changes are a little bit more difficult to make when it comes to some portions of the design and then the next level is, is after we get feedback um, at this meeting and over the next month or so we will continue to make changes and then that's when we get to the 90 percentile and then we get to actual construction 
So with that, in 2023 and 2024, we continued engagement uh, with business owners and the public. We did pop-ups and other things. And then in 2024, we um, are where we are now with the 60% design updates and the meeting this evening. I think I'm in the meet, right? I think so. Okay, perfect. <laughs> I'll jump in if you miss anything. Yeah, no, that's great. So uh, what is the need of this project? Why are we looking at this project? So we do have crashes in this area. Um, we had crashes specifically at the intersection that everybody is interested in, the Florida 15 third intersection. We have crashes that resulted in injuries. Um, and that's something that we really look at. And the Federal Highway Administration now, you know, the big goal is to reduce serious injury crashes. And really the goal is to get those zero injury crashes um, and zero fatalities. So at 40 to 3rd and 15th intersection, we do have injury crashes that have occurred at that intersection. And then throughout the corridor, we know that East 2nd Avenue is a very popular bike and pet area. So the city conducts counts at 11 different locations, um, which are highlighted right here. Uh, we do those counts every two years, and we've been doing them since 2009. And as you can see, East 2nd Avenue and 15th is on the far left. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. And as you can see, it is our highest count when it comes to bicyclists and pedestrians. And uh, last year when we did the counts, we actually looked and a lot of those cyclists are going up that hill, going all the way to 13th. And then from there, you know, they're either going towards the Smiley building or they're heading down 13th towards Main. So we know a lot of that traffic is going all the way into downtown. So part of this project is looking at uh, creating a safe space for those cyclists and really connecting them all the way to downtown. And then also uh, pedestrians as well, because they are in this area. And then lastly, uh, Florida, which comes in, has a lot of um, pedestrian and cyclists on it as well. And then when they get to the 40 to 15 third intersection, it's a little bit, um, it can, you know, your, your options aren't the best when you get there, especially if you're on, if you're a cyclist. So then we'll, uh, lack of sidewalk connectivity is another thing we're looking at addressing. So this clip shows some of that sidewalk connectivity that is missing. Um, again, we have a lot of uh, pedestrians in this zone and uh, this area has also been designated as a URA. So that effort, which uh, Tommy Crosby can detail uh, way better than I can, um, but basically it is, you know, it's been designated as an area with blight and we were looking at Redevelopment, so it allows redevelopment opportunities and helps with that redevelopment in the area. And so that's why the pedestrian and the connectivity and all that will be even more important as we move into the future. So I'll cover the project scope and then hand it over to Steve. But um, again, safety is a big component of that. And it is called the Midtown Safety and Connectivity Improvement Project. So traffic calming is something we talk a lot about, but what we're really talking about there is slowing speeds. That's really what traffic calming is and making things more predictable. Um, and intersection improvements, that's a lot of where uh, traffic calming really makes things predictable and slows people down. Bicycle improvements. And the other thing I'll point out about traffic calming is there's been a lot of studies and there's a lot of data out there. Uh, when you look at speed limits and when pedestrians get hit, if a car is going 20 miles per hour and it hits a pedestrian, they have one in 10 chances of it being a fatality. If it, they're going at 30 miles per hour, it's about 50% of it being a fatality. And once you're hit 40 miles per hour, it's 9 out of 10 are fatality when it comes to pedestrians. Connectivity, um, the Ames River Trail to downtown, again, that is a major connection point that we know from the counts that we do. Um, Florida to downtown, again, if you're up in the Riverview neighborhood, um, you know, if you're, we have some new housing projects being proposed out of Florida. If you're in the Mets Lane area, Florida is really your major connection point to downtown. And then accessibility, there is a transit stop um, by Tamron Square that we're improving with this project. So improvements to that, and then updating sidewalks and curb ramps, and that's from an accessibility standpoint. With that, I will hand it over to Steve. Thank you, sir. Try not to mess anything up while I'm getting set up here, but um, 
Thank you for coming tonight. Steve Winters again, and I apologize, I forgot my name tonight, so I'll try to reintroduce myself a few times. Um, one of the things in Devon said, I can only talk for a few minutes on this one because I think we talked for 20 to 30 minutes on this last time. But one of the big components of this project was to do a traffic study initially. Um, one of the features that CDOT's going to do um, at Camino and 14th is prohibit the left turn southbound, and I'll try to show that on the map here. But they're basically going to um, stop people from turning left at that intersection as a part of the access control, control plan that Devin mentioned. So we've got to um, basically account for that because those left turns are going to start to go uh, left at 15th Street or they're going to go south onto Main Street and then through downtown um, to turn left on 12th, 11th, some of those other streets. So that was one of the main considerations that we had early on. Um, additionally, um, the desire for the cycle track on East 2nd, Devin mentioned a few times that there's a lot of traffic coming from the Rotary Park, coming from the Endless River Trail that's trying to get to downtown. So we're trying to make that a safer alternative. Um, in order to do that, um, we're limiting and we're uh, basically making East 2nd one way um, in a couple of, from 15th down to 13th, and we'll talk about that some more in a little bit, we've got some of the exhibits, but in order to do that, you've got to you've got to create that width, and we're um, making that road one way in a few areas. So that's changing some of the traffic patterns, and then we've also added in the conceptual um, designs of the Lolita uh, 15th and East Third um, alternatives that we've studied. So we talked about this quite a bit the last time. There was, I think, 15 different alternatives that we um, analyzed as a part of that. And the main findings uh, were that if CDOT ultimately closes uh, the left, left bound, uh, the southbound lefts at Main and 14th, that it doesn't completely blow up uh, the Midtown intersections. Uh, the East 2nd Avenue, uh, basically the one way from 15th to 14th from 15th to 14th southbound was acceptable, and one way northbound from 13th to 14th was acceptable. And then ultimately, the mini roundabout was the preferred alternative, both from safety and traffic perspectives uh, during that initial study. However, it was not preferred um, at that time. It was suggested, let's look at the 14th punch through. So that's what we did at that time. And we, we've since done that. So some of the benefits, and Devin mentioned most of these, but you get increased pedestrian uh, bicycle safety in that corridor. You basically create that cycle track. Uh, we're, we're trying to narrow up some of the intersections so that it slows down traffic. Uh, people are able to cross the streets easier. Uh, increased ADA compliance, Devin mentioned it. We're gonna redo some of those ramps. A lot of uh, ramps, that have been built in the past or out of compliance, basically you end up with steeper slopes or you don't have um, detectable warning plates um, that folks have a hard time seeing. Um, there's also uh, just areas where there's not sidewalks. So that's one of the things that we're adding. And then the bus stop uh, at Tamarins Square that Devin mentioned. Um, one of the big things that I would say Devin worked on really hard was the the goal to maintain access to all the residential and commercial properties. There were a few alternatives that, if you guys notice, we had in the 30% plans that we've since removed. Um, so those things have been changed since that initial meeting. And then we've added some landscape. And then I'll turn this one back to them because this is just some of the public engagement that he's worked on. And thanks, Dave. Um, just kind of wanted to highlight this. So, you know, with this project, I think we've been we've been trying to do a lot of public engagement with it. It is a complex project um, that impacts a lot of people, not just the people in this area, but it impacts all, you know, basically the north and west part of town or east part of town. Um, so again, May 23rd, 
that was the open house in 2023. Uh, we had 52 attendees. We did two farmer's market booths that were dedicated to Midtown um, that summer, and we had 56 responses from the uh, Two days tabling at Brokery Park, so we really wanted to kind of capture that uh, cyclist voice. We had done a lot of work with business owners and with others, but we hadn't really captured the uh, folks that were on the Amos River Trail using that corridor all the time. And then we had an online survey where we got 38 responses and a focus group, which we did last year. And the focus group was, uh, I don't know another word to say, focused um, on the 40 to 50 to 30 intersection. And, you know, out of that, that's really where the left turn or alternative that you're going to see tonight came from. Multiple meetings with businesses and property owners, um, kind of numerous enough with some of the property owners and businesses multiple times. <laughs> And then what we heard, um, and I get this whole summary is actually online as well. Uh, so there was strong support for curb extensions, and that kind of came through all the feedback we got. There was support for cycle connectivity, um, you know, in general throughout the corridor. And then desire to maintain parking was definitely more enforced by specifically a lot of businesses and some of the residents that live in the area. And then there was mixed support for the many roundabout. Uh, we had another alternative that was originally on there called a continuous flow intersection. That one had a large amount of negative um, input. I do think it is it is essentially what we had at Highway 550 and Highway 160. It does work, <laughs> um, but it can look a little scary on paper. Um, but yeah, that, that mainly kind of wraps up. And again, all that engagement is online for your viewing. You know, we have even the pictures of the posters with sticky notes, and you can really see where people were putting happy faces and all of that. So yeah, that's all available online. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we we kind of talked about this a little bit. Um, but yeah, at second ab, the plan is a two-way cycle track, and it's again on the exhibits in the back. Um, I talked about this a little bit, but the the current preferred alternative is northbound from 13th to 14th Street for uh, vehicles, and then southbound from 15th to 14th. So basically, you're pushing all of the vehicles um, that are moving one way towards 14th, and then they'll be able to um, turn left and go out to Camino and exit. Or they could turn east and in, in um, east second, uh, east of um, or actually 14th east of east second will be a two-way street in that location. Um, we've got proposed sidewalk connectivity and all of these. There are sections of property where there just isn't sidewalk out there. It's tough to walk through, and as Devin mentioned, um, if and when the URA starts to promote some of this growth in this area, um, those sidewalk connections will be important for pedestrians. Um, like I mentioned earlier, curb extensions at Second Ave, uh, that's going to help slow down some of those folks um, coming uh, both down Second Ave and then um, at 14th. Um, it's kind of used right now as a cut through in some instances to get out to Camino, but those types of improvements will, will hopefully slow down traffic um, and make it a more color friendly space for pedestrians and bicyclists. Um, again, um, there's a transit stop out there right now at Tamron Square, but it, it doesn't meet ADA. That's an at-risk population. So that's a part of this. Uh, trying to level that area off, um, put in an actual structure um, so that people can get out of the elements um, and level that off uh, so that if you're waiting for a bus, it's it's not um, it's not difficult or as difficult. Um, and again, uh, one of the other things that and, and when we get back to the boards, it's probably best to talk about these individually. There's about 20 um, parking stalls that would be lost in this area. It's kind of scattered through um, through the neighborhood. There's uh, several up on 15th Street, um, north of the furniture store. Um, Devin did a good job of talking to them and, and they weren't uh, concerned with that area. There's a few at each of the ball box the intersections and what happens there is you you take some of that real estate to create the bulbs um, which slows down the uh the vehicles probably through there but you end up losing a uh, parking stall uh at each of the four corners here's um we've talked about it a couple times but here's the actual 
routing showing what second uh, app will look like. So from 13 to 14, it'd be one way northbound, and from 14 to 15, it'd be one way southbound. Okay, I think we've ran to our question and answer section. Let me get the box. I'm not and, and I'll, I'll say it for you, but I, um, we do really want to focus on the second half corridor at this time because we're going to get another reputation on the alts at uh, 15th, 3rd, and uh, uh, Florida. So if you have specific comments about the East Second, let's talk about that and then go into the other presentation. Okay. Um, yeah, we have this broken up into two different sections, but there'll be two different question and answers this evening. So this one will be 15 minutes. The next one will be 20 minutes. This first one is focused on just that second avenue corridor, not the intersection itself. Um, so 15 minutes for that. And then know that for general, like just comments and you're giving your feedback, we have all these stations set up back there for commenting. Okay, so if you need a question answered in order to, be, to feel better informed, to form an opinion, for what's going on back there at the end of both these presentations. Um, Stacey, again, we'll go for it. I will be the one to answer though, so stay close. All right, yes. Um, the bike lane, it shows like a concrete divider between north town and south town. Um, why, is, why is the entire bike lane not separated from the vehicle lane? Yeah, that's a great question. So. Uh, because of the steepness of the grade on that hill, um, so if you have cyclists pumping, is you know what it's termed is when they're going uphill, and then you have cyclists that are hauling down that. Um, those cyclists are going to be a little more comfortable if they're not in that cycling lane. We did look at that, um, but that space, you're kind of mixing two people going very different speeds, um, and again with the pumping on the way up, that's why we separated that. Um, you know, just trying to look at. The overall safety aspect for all users. It's all about um, separating users that are going drastically different speeds. Yeah, but shouldn't it be separating cars from bicyclists? I mean, that's the overall goal to separate cars from bicyclists. One of the other constraints um, with doing that is we have to maintain a 20 foot fire lane there. So if you start to do that with the parking adjacent to there, and then if you just have a 12 foot Travel lane, you end up not having enough room to get fire trucks and emergency vehicles through them. And then I'll, I'll add just a little bit more to the cyclist concern. So, again, it's, it's cyclists when you're going the same speed as a vehicle, and on a short section like this, uh, you know, like the, the safety concern is a lot lower, um, even if they are mixed in the same space. It just looks a little bit differently. Um, but yeah. I would disagree with that. Tell that to the guy who was killed on three roads. So all bike lanes should be separated by a, a divider from vehicle lanes. People will feel safer and they'll be more likely to ride their bikes unless we have less vehicles on the road. Right there in black. Um, uh, same from like Rotary Park crossing 15th. It was hard to see on the maps. Those crosswalks been shortened. Like there's no bulbs that show there, like on 14 and second. And just the speeds there on 15, they're kind of fast going down the hill and more traffic coming off of the main hour. We're going to be going fast up the hill. Um, and yeah, just wondering if there's any plans to like control the crossing on second or they recycle traffic. And that can't side We're definitely looking at balls on the south side. We haven't looked at the north side. I think it's going to be constrained by that north through lane, but we, we can look at it. And the, the other piece to that is um, when we started this project, you know, when those RRBs went in, the rectangle rapid flashing beacons that everybody pushes the buttons with. Um, when those were put in, there was a lot of coordination with the train during that time. Um, so there's also like some limited capability as far as what we can put out there for the uh, public utility commission. The train is dictated by. So that's another piece. 
Well, let me make sure I understood it. I, so there's the lights right now. Correct. Is there anything? There will, right now, we don't have that proposed. Um, we have to take a look at putting in another RRFB or something. I mean, that's what it would be. Um, would be another rectangle of the rectangle if I should be again on 14th. And we have not looked at doing that there. The traffic volumes on 14th they all are a lot lower, but if we did make that left turn that's coming down on 14th, that may be something that we need to look at if those volumes are really high. There's a lot of traffic volume going across. Um, one of the problems with the bike path, I'm referring to the Central Avenue bike path, is that it's a bike path that ends up dumping out on the street anyway. And the bikes have to attempt to negotiate the intersection of 13th and 12th. So, and also addressing her concern about separation, wondering if we can put the bike path on the east side of Second Avenue, either inboard of the cars will that be completely separated from traffic more outboard in the cars like you just say on the main street yeah good question we did look at that um there's a couple things so one the current campus river trail where it uh, terminates uh near river park is already on the west side um also as you head up the hill um well i guess earlier on there's fewer driveways there's only two driveways on that side and then on the upper section, you know, there is some existing parking and driveway curb cuts, which we're looking at changing that parking scenario. The other thing is, you know, we are coordinating some of the Civic Center and where that new path is going to be. So we're working somewhat to see how best that works. And then the last piece is the shade that is on that uphill section between 14th and 15th, or sorry, 14th and 13th. Um, on that, what on the east side. It does, it's shady over there a lot more during the winter time. So, just consideration for ice and snow. And the parking, and that, yeah, that's the other key piece is that that part of parking is technically not city property. That was not in the city right of way either. So, that is currently on the private property. That's a private deal, right? Correct. Which is why it's on one side versus the other. Correct. That's another key piece. What I thought. Thank you. How about um, my question? What's the width of the ownership? Huh? I think they own eight and a half feet. Eight feet and a half. So yeah. then you can put the bike path on the outside. Yeah, that's it, yeah. Ne next to parking is not ideal, uh, just because of what's called the door conflict zone, especially when you have cyclists riding downhill um, with those kind of speeds, and then you have somebody open their door. Um, it's a yeah, dangerous area. Yeah. It's, it's, much of the bicycle lane is parking to his bike set off and down Main Street, Third Avenue, made the best boat we have. Currently, those are shared use. Um, so they're shared lanes, they're not actually bicycle lanes. And then a shared lane, really, the bicycles, when you're next to parallel parking, you want to be at least five feet away from the car doors because the car door usually swings about three feet. Uh, we share plans. I mean, no, these are going to be actually. Okay, we got another question. I have another question about the same topic with um, the parking areas being privately owned. What happens if he changes his mind and he doesn't want this? That's a good question. I don't have a direct answer with that. Um, you know, I guess in general. It is his property, but uh, yeah, that's that's a discussion we can keep having. Um, because as your what happens if he so, so yeah, I can I can clarify the question. The question was, what happens if the owner of the parking that is on Second Avenue between 14th and 13th Street, what if the owner of that portion decides to remove that parking um, and turn it into something else? Um, does, does he have that choice? Property, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's 
Hi, everybody. I'm Keith Gordy. I'm a city engineer. I don't, I don't have an exact answer, but I would say this is a little bit more planning question um, in the sense of if you decided to change my views and take away parking, you'd have to demonstrate that there may be parking necessary for the building. And so there may be some restrictions or other considerations, like maybe this is going to ask for a sidewalk or a bike trail or something. We would have to really look at it, and they would have to come in and go through a finding process. To, and to go so you that. might also know this answer. Um, for a residence, or to have a residence or a business, how many parking spots do you have to have? I would have to defer that to planning to do that calculation. Sorry. Okay. Okay, just curious because I live there and I'm curious how many parking spots I'm supposed to have. So I indictment as a land development engineer, but the city has a code that says, okay, if you develop commercial property, you need one stall per X number of square feet. So if he comes in or she or whoever owns that and wants to develop, there there are parking requirements and then there will be setback requirements and then there will be sidewalk and, and like he said landscaping requirements. Um, whether that is in that parking lane or somewhere else, that's a far lengthier conversation. In the third one. At the corner of 13th and 2nd, uh, the side, if you're, if you're coming to 14th and going up hill, sidewalk into it. Is that part of where you're going to put sidewalk in? So besides the bikes and the cars, the pedestrians you get a place. Yes. Can you repeat that question? Yeah. If you're coming from 14 and heading up the hill, and if you're on the west side, there's a sidewalk, but why? Correct. And then the sidewalk is no longer. Correct. Are you going to finish the sidewalk? Yes, that is what we are showing, is connecting that sidewalk, and then it actually would connect on the south side of 13th as well. But it's still down the street. Sidewalk. Right? Doesn't it? Or bike path goes into the street. The sidewalk goes around the building. Is that the way it is? Correct. Yes. The sidewalk fully does connect to a crosswalk, and then the, the cycle track would eventually connect to something on the Civic Center. We've got time for about two more questions. I have a question on Ken, and you probably have done a deal for you to deal here. Um, Second Avenue between uh, 14th and 15th being one way that way. What happens when something happens on 15th Street in that first block and you cannot go up that hill? Not, and I'm not talking third left to third, I'm talking there to your left, no, to your left. There. Something happens there. All that traffic that you, used to, that you could take 14th and then go down second and go up 15th, if something happens in that first block. I guess I, uh, I, I might need. So, if there's a, a stoppage in traffic there? Yes, you have, you have, whether it's an accident, you have, and it's been closed. Yeah. Okay. So, so if it's closed and you're traveling westbound, you can go south. No, 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 no. I'm coming off of Camino del Rio and I've got to turn right to get up the hill. Mm -hmm. I can't. You know, I mean, those the, those cases are temporary. Um, you know, if something does happen, we do have to sometimes traffic just has to go around. Like if we're talking about a crash or something like that. Blocking a building problem. I mean, there's stuff oh, there, whatever there. Yeah, I mean, it's not just like you can go around the block. I'll also right. say if you get to this point and you're trying to turn light, right, it's too late to go back to 14 by the time you get to that's that true. Block. But if you if you and if the city and whatever yeah. you have signs and you know you can't go there, which is what usually happens, you turn on 14. Yeah. You take second. You go up. Yeah, and I will say you know like if it's if it's a construction matter, then they have to submit what's called a, a traffic control plan or what we call an MHT, and they would have to figure that out and say, okay, how are people getting from here? And we would work with them as a city on how to divert traffic during that construction period. And then otherwise, you know, if it is a crash, then it is a temporary scenario, which, you know, a lot of times with those scenarios, it, it, it does um, affect traffic. I I know that understand what happens up there, like when you get up to the top from 13th, 
and there's going to be leaves and convention center traffic starting right, and people are going in and out and forward, backward, and out of smiling. And then the bicyclists are coming around the corner and the pedestrians are coming up. I don't see what happens up here that isn't that boom dog. How is that all going to be directed? Is there going to be a stop sign? What? What? What's going to happen? Underpass. What? So the inter are you talking about the intersection at 15th and 33rd? Oh, okay, gotcha. Well, okay. uh, and just to clarify, there's not a convention center. I just want to make sure that's clear for the room. Like, there's a, no, <laughs> <laughs> so it's not a convention center going on. It's, it's, and we're not even calling it a city center anymore. It's just like the new city hall police department. But yes, okay. Now I know what you're talking about, guys. Okay. <laughs> It'll be a south control intersection, likely at 13. Um, there's crosswalks, stop control, stop sign. Yeah, and, and I'm not actively working on this, I'm not sure who is, but that site plan will be integrated with this. And, and I can't speak for them, but the city engineer is obviously aware of both projects and will, will ensure that that they are married together in a way that limits those conflicts is, is what I can say at this time. All right, we have one more question. You've been so patient, thank you. So so I, I keep coming back to I ride my bike all over town. I like riding my bikes, I like riding bikes. And um uh I just keep chasing this like I, I don't, to Robert's point, I don't understand if it's really the safest way of getting bicyclists to that area. Like, and, and I'm, I have to deal with the underpass, but what happens to the underpass on the commuter? Like, if, are we looking at fastest bike routes? Well, if people want to ride fast, they can go on the mountain bike trips. Sorry. But, or are we looking at the safest way of getting these, these the bicyclists to downtown? Yeah. No, great question. I think that's safe at all. I'm sorry. Uh, it, but, um, you know, connectivity, I think cyclists, pedestrians, even drivers, um, we all like to take the quickest, most efficient way possible. Sure, so this cycle track, yeah, the, this cycle track is focused in catering to a lot of the folks that are really north and uh, northeast of town. The underpass, the green underpass, which we're actually working on together as well. Um, which we talked about, that one is really heavily catered to the west end, to the west side of Highway 550 or North Main. Uh, that's really the, the folks that that one is capturing. Um, we, you know, again, we do the cycle, bicycle and pedestrian counts every two years, and so we do know the counts of who's crossing at night and who's crossing at 12 and who's crossing here. And so that's that's it's, it's a little bit different in who the people are that it's capturing. Um, but yeah, when we term safety, so the Federal Highway Administration, as well as NACTO, ASHTO, other guidances out there that I don't write, that way smarter people than me write, have kind of guidance. What is the volume level of traffic on a road? What are the speeds? And what are the safest cycling facilities? And so you put in a separated cycle track that is a safer one one of the safest types because it separates all the users. Um, granted, intersections are always a tricky one, right? Yeah, and that's not what I'm chasing, Kevin. Yeah. Like, we, we, like, now we, not, not only are we like, we think it's a good idea, we're also encouraging bicyclists to come into this intersection because now this is actually bike lane, this is where bikes go, but you're shooting them out into yes. steadily growing, uh, like pressure on this uh, intersection, where I think it's kind of it's already dangerous. Like now, bicyclists don't have to adhere to stop signs. It's going to be chaos and not safe. I, I think the safe way is to encourage people to go through the underpass. I, I just can't see you shooting into that intersection. And I'll just follow up with one thing. That's why we're proposing the other traffic calming elements at the intersections to improve that safety when cyclists and pedestrians are.
Okay. We're going to move on to the second part. We have more stuff to cover. Right, right. Um, so we have the actual um, intersection at Florida 53rd. Um, so we're going to jump into information on that. Um, and then we'll have another question and answer session. And then from there, we'll move into the breakout session where, you know, the comments about safety and your concerns and things like that, we will be posted up back there to address those and talk through it with a map right in front of us and some fits and all that fun stuff. Thank you. If, if we didn't answer your questions now, I, I would also say reach out to us. We will be in the back later on and, and more than willing to talk. Throw your comments down right, right on those maps so that we get those. Okay. Um, so, Florida 15th and 3rd, the, the intersection. No, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Devin said no jokes, so um, this is a tough one, and, and I've been telling a few people that if it was easy, it probably would have been, been done years ago. Um, so we want to hear your input. We want to get your 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 thoughts, your comments. I think um, Devin and Sarah have been really open about soliciting that, so I commend them. Um, we we've, we've been looking at three alternatives. We've actually looked at many more. Some of them were. Um, shown at the original 30% uh, design, the CFI that Devin mentioned, um, the mini roundabout was presented. Um, the left turn wasn't at that time, but we have looked at it since then. And then the other alternative is uh, minimal uh, intersection changes, um, which is alternative one. So we're gonna talk through those and then open it up to questions and uh, away we go. So, Alternative one, um, this one uh, is, is you can leave that intersection as it is, kind of kick your hand down the road for a while, um, try to do uh, a few minor things, site improvement impacts. It's tough to make the left turns, but going northbound, uh, which is the direction we're looking, and then the westbound uh, left turn, um, it's, it's difficult to get up the hill Going eastbound at 15th, um, it's obviously low cost, uh, little to few um, construction impacts. Um, it's obviously the best at pre preserving what's out there. Um, the disadvantages of this is it doesn't really address any of the concerns that are out there. You can kind of see on that north edge, that bike path narrows to, I think it's five or six feet as you're coming southbound. Um, leads to some concerns. That would be one of the things that we would look at, um, potentially cleaning that up. There's some pedestrian um, issues. But the main thing would be try to do, try to work with what's out there uh, and call it limp a lot for a little, little bit longer. Um, it doesn't address kind of the, the left turns and some of those safety uh, issues that are out there right now. Um, one of the things um, that, that that intersection is kind of set up really well for right now are, are T-bone uh, accidents where you're driving and somebody broadsides you. Um, and the only thing worse than that is a head-on, but it, it's basically set up to, to do that with three of the, uh, the legs the way they're set up right now. So that's the first one. The second one is the mini roundabout. Um, I know Devin has been talking to a lot of the folks that live up on Third Ave on this. This is a slightly different version. Um, Jeff in my office has done a great job of pushing this a little bit further north, um, which was one of the recommendations. Uh, roundabouts generally solve some of the issues with traffic. Um, instead of a, a T-bone uh, crash, a lot of the crashes in a roundabout are low speed broadside. So think about two cars kind of trying to merge together that just hit each other at lower speeds versus that T-bone. So that, that is a benefit of that. The roundabout also has um, the best long-term level of service uh, of any of the alternatives that we've looked at. Uh, removing the northbound lefts does help and it does help for a while, but the roundabout actually helps for a longer period of time. 
based on the expected growth rates. And then the disadvantages, this one's expensive. Um, it's impactful. It's got a lot of construction with it. Um, it's probably $3 million now. Um, by the time we build it, it factor in some inflation on it. Um, it. It is definitely a big project. It definitely will impact traffic at that intersection or the um, duration of the construction project. Um, one of the other things that I kind of want to mention, and we're, we're saying sort of two things, but I want to talk about this one. Growth, if it accelerates past historic norms, roundabouts do fail in the future. Um, they have a really good range of ADTs, which is about um, 18 to 22,000 ADT. Um, an ADT is an average daily traffic trip. Um, and right now there's about 14 to 15,000 ADT out there. So in normal growth um, experience, this would probably have a life of 25 to 30 years uh, on an expected design. Um, we talked a little bit about the construction impacts, but it would definitely impact both the traveling public and the folks that live around there. And then one of the disadvantages and one of the things that we heard um, early and often was it's definitely got um, drawbacks uh, based on the conversations that we've had with the East Third Historic Preservation Board. And then the third alternative, this one was um, an alternative that we started looking at it after our last uh, public meeting. This intersection right there is 14. There's currently not an access through there right now. Uh, there's about uh, five to six feet of grade difference for anybody that's been out there. Uh, this is the northbound lane. It's about five to six feet higher. This is the southbound lane. Basically in this alternative, you would force vehicles that would be going up to 15 to turn left earlier, turn left down to 14, and then go all the way out to, excuse me, go all the way out to Camino to turn right to go north. Um, this, this was studied, it was looked at. Um, positives, it, it improves the safety and operation of 15 that gets rid of those left turns that are heading north. That's one of the uh, three large conflicts out there. Um, it has, I'll say this, there's opportunities for additional improvements at 3rd and 15th. You can fix some of the site distance. You can fix some of the, um, the trail connection to issues. There's some head and sidewalk things that, that could be done. The disadvantages is this is also a very high cost option. Um, it's got a bigger range because there's some uncertainty. This portion right here might be about 1.2 million, but if you go up and you start making some of the site distance improvements to 15th, 3rd, and Florida, it could be a $2.5 million uh, option. The other thing that this would do is impact um, on-street parking. You can kind of see here, there's a slightly uh, well, a much smaller median um, in between those, but it also has a lot of grading, a lot of shading in here because there's so much grade difference. It also has um, impacts to 18 of those mature trees in the median. Um, so it is, it is a very impactful um, alternative to East Third Ave. Uh, one of the other alternatives that I'll just, or, or not alternatives, but uh, points on this one is if you prohibit the left turns up at let me back and slide. If you prohibit these left turns uh, northbound, it effectively makes all of these properties on East Third a right in, right out access. So you can only turn right into your house, um, which is the case now, but you can only turn right out and you don't have that intersection to turn left to then get back south, your earliest opportunity to make that left turn would be to go all the way up to Chapman and go through the roundabout. So that being said, those are the alternatives. Uh, we're gonna open it back up to questions and comments. I think Nancy's gonna come up and 
from the show. Okay, again, this is for the intersection specific we um, that we just talked about the three alternatives. We're going to do a poll after the question and answer asking which one you would prefer, um, which will be with a QR code. So get your cell phones ready while you're waiting. Um, we're looking a little tight on time. We're going to do 15 to 20 minutes for questions, but please, please try to be respectful of one another and leave it to questions so we have enough time for feedback in the back. Okay. Earlier in the presentation, it's mentioned that CDOT may close off left turns on the 14th coming from North Main. CDOT is closing off. Okay, so they are going to do that. That, I'm assuming, drives more traffic turning on 15th to come up to the 15th and 3rd intersection. Has your traffic modeling studied that increased traffic at the location? Yep. <laughs> yeah, so the question was, is CDOT closing um, southbound lefts at Camino, um, North Main, and 14th, 15th. And that is, yes, 14th, 14th yes, sorry. That is certain. That is happening, um, I believe, this summer as a part of their ACP. Um, the, the way our study worked is we did kind of a sensitivity analysis. We did a, we did a version where we said 80% is going to turn left at 15, then 20% is going to go straight through to Maine. And then we did another version with 20% making that left turn at 15, and 80% going through. And this is assuming the 14th turn is yes. close off. Yes, that that was the assumption, and that was the analysis that was done. So we kind of did sensitivity. What's the worst case for 15, and what's the worst case for Maine? And the numbers say how many more cars are showing up at that? Yeah. Third? Is there a number to the how many more cars show up? There is, but I don't. There is a number, but I, I don't have it off the top. Do you have an idea of percentage? In other well, words, does it, is it going up 50%, 25%? Look, um, I don't know that, but it, it was 80% of the left turns that would be made at 14 would go up, would go to 15. I can get you that number at some point, but I just don't have it. The, the concern is my follow up question to the same question is. If that intersection eventually fails, even with the wrap up, it's mentioned there it's going to fail at some point in time 50 years, 40 years, 15 years, 25 to 30. 25 to 30 years. Does that take into account all that extra traffic that's yes. going to So that already accounts for it? Yes. Okay. Jim? Yeah, this is a quick yes and no or no. Um, I heard that the focus group was unanimously opposed to the roundabout. Is that true or false? I don't know if I would say opposed, but they were unanimously, unanimously for the left turn. <laughs> left turn on which? On oh, no, 14th. 14th Street alternative. Correct. Left turn going north? No, for this uh, 14th Street left turn alternative. Yeah, I would say that they were unanimously in favor of that option. But they didn't see that option. They, they were much simplified option. They never saw that. Correct. Yes, that is correct. They did not have this option directly in front of them at the time. Did anyone speak in favor of the, any roundabout? In the focus group? Of the, uh, the five people? Yes. Um, we have somebody pointing to themselves yeah. saying yes. Yeah, I, I didn't hear anybody say that. That's why. I like the roundabout. Okay. Anything's okay. better than what they did. Well, and that's why I didn't want to say that everybody was fully opposed because that wasn't necessarily the sentiment given. It came up with the left turn lane. It was. Yeah. Right here. I'm just wondering on the roundabout, where does the southbound sidewalk go on the northbound third? In the cross. They stand by the tree. Yeah. Traffic. Okay. It's right under the tree. Yeah. 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 Did everyone get that question? She was, she was concerned about where the sidewalk went. I just want to make sure we're done. Oh, okay. it's, it's under the tree in the meeting. Under the tree in the meeting. I can help me answer that one. Yeah, so it. Right there. Is where it would be. The reason why it has to be set back, though, is so that when vehicles. It, the benefit of a roundabout is when a vehicle comes up, they're only looking one way. And by that point, they're also not looking for pedestrians. They're just looking for one car. 
Um, it also reduces the conflict points. But a major benefit to pedestrians is that when the pedestrian and the car meet, the car only needs to look for the pedestrian. It's not looking at traffic at that time. So once it gets past that crosswalk, then that's when they will collect and turn back. I just want to note too that we did remove the pedestrian crossing on the west leg due to the grade, but it is on the east leg. And the thought was there's probably once there's an opportunity to cross on the east leg. They would go down to second. There's probably not many people that would need to cross on that west leg of the Council again. Well, so since she moved the new ground back a little bit, are there any new tables? I believe all of these fit within the roadway, right, Joe? There's a are there any new takings with the move of the roundabout? There are two. There are two pinch points. There's a pinch point on the southeast corner where we uh, the sidewalk is, and I believe we could make that work with a vertical wall. There's also a pinch point right where you were, Steve. Sorry, on the mic. There's a pinch point on the north side, uh, right in that area where we might. We were trying to hold a ten foot sidewalk on Florida all the way down to second. Um, that might be like eight feet or a little pinch point there because that that corner of that property does come out quite a bit. There's bikeways. I don't see any bikeways. And, then, and when you're coming south on Florida, can you turn on to third southbound? I mean, so yes. Are you allowed to go southbound? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. To answer the to answer the bike lane question, so uh, roundabouts, there's um, quite a bit of studies and design uh, requirements for roundabouts. You don't have a bike lane in a roundabout. You have an option. So the way roundabouts are designed is you have an option to either exit the roundabout if you're on a bike, get on the sidewalk, you can ride through the intersection that way, or you do what's called a shared lane. And again, the reason why even a shared lane, I bike every day all day, and I bike through roundabouts all the time. And I also read all these studies, and this is all I do all day. Um, <laughs> roundabouts are safer for cyclists because it does slow down speeds. And as Steve was talking about earlier, when a car comes into a roundabout, it's not going to hit a bike and a broadside angle. It's not going to hit a bike from like, straight behind. It's going to be at like a very sensitive angle. So I've been hit three times in my life. I understand what happens when you get hit by a vehicle on a bike. And roundabouts are actually safer for folks, even cyclists. Um, and that's the two options for you. All right, one final question in the back. It's just a great question. I, I see on here that the roundabout will be lowered to allow for a maximum 4% grade. I'm assuming that's for cars in the winter coming up 15 so they don't get stuck when it's they're, they're having yields to cars in there it's icy right <laughs> so one of the issues when they lowered this intersection in 2012 to accommodate for that great issue is they created grade going down if you're traveling north on east third now you have cars sliding into the intersection because you lowered it and created great and all those old pine trees seem to create a lot of ice and build up have you guys considered that component of it, the bottleneck and traffic in there, how to address that problem? So the question was, uh, have we considered the grade northbound? Is that a correct statement? Yeah. Okay. Um, two things, and then I'll probably turn it over to Jeff. Um, one of the one of the drawbacks of this is definitely the 15th Street coming up because you're you're now introducing the possibility that if you're going up Florida. That you would have to yield to somebody in the roundabout. Jeff has created a flat spot here. I think it's for a vehicle or two. And then the other thing that he's he's done is create a slip lane here for anybody going down third to try to correct that. If this is advanced, um, there may need to be some other considerations to the grade on this. Um, he's thought a lot about this coming in. He's um, designed it, and, and here's where I'll, where I'll shut up. But He's designed this coming in at a flatter, a flat slope of four percent, which generally in the winter, anything five percent and under is manageable with snow plows and snow removal. 
So there's a there's a four percent coming into this. And Jeff, anything I missed? It might be a little steeper than four percent, but that was at a, a concept thirty percent level. But we did chase that grade right back quite a bit on third, and that's one of the reasons for that cost that you saw the three million dollars because there's there's impacts to those properties that are required some mall on the southeast corner. And then you can chase that grade back. Because to your point, we're dropping the grade right at this another round about uh, two feet or two and a half feet. And we do have to chase that back quite a bit on the third. Okay. We're gonna wrap it up. Um, and then we're we're we just have 15 minutes left, but we want to make sure we have plenty of time back for the breakout session. But before we do that. We're gonna move on to our quick poll. So if you, this is pretty small, so we have sheets printed off to um, scan and access the quick poll, asking you which one you prefer out of those three alternatives for the intersection. So if you'd like to do that, here's, um, take a click and pass it around. We have more than those in the back. Sarah's coming up front with a few more. Um, so if you wanna mind taking about a couple minutes to submit your response, which one you would prefer. And then from there, we're gonna jump into the breakout session in the back. We have it set up. I'll let you kind of describe how it's set up in the back, Devin, um, and exactly what we're asking for. Yeah, so we set it up to kind of match what this area looks like. So 13th Street is down here on the north end. And unfortunately, I switched it to a flip flop. 13th Street is on the north end. 15th Street is on the south end. Um, we have the intersection treatments, but yeah, we have it kind of set up and laid out like Midtown looks, and that's where we'll go. If you don't have a phone or device with you to do the poll, um, this will be this will be up tomorrow on our Engage Durango website, and that URL is right here as well, but, um, and on the sheet that's going around. We have, we have one thing real quick to explain. Um, Jeff is going to take a quick second. I don't have a clicker. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There was a question about backing out into the roundabout. Yeah. Can you clarify what are you talking about from the southeast corner? Uh, southeast corner. I'm backing the roundabout. And you would so these driveways, I think you refer to one of these two properties. So you were actually would access getting back on the third at this location right here, so that you could face into the roundabout. So you you back out, there's a fair amount of pavement width. That area in the background around here. What's the turn radius? So the thought there there's a, a fair amount of I don't know the exact mean. There's a fair, this whole area right here would be paved for turning movements, backing out. You could also back out and then forward. You would not be backing into the roundabouts. You could turn a full length vehicle like a truck around in there. You would probably do something like a hammerhead turn, a three point turn. You haven't figured that engineering part out at 60%. Uh, there would be, there's there's been some thought behind being able to pull back out similar to a typical driveway of backing out on the driveway plan. Some thought. Sixty percent. Well, similar to a how most most of the time you back out from a driveway under the road, you would be doing the same. You would not be backing out into the back. You would be backing on the third. That answers that. Yeah. Okay, everybody. We will see you back there. <laughs> that looks like a really hard problem. You guys have thought of a lot of things. Trying to. Trying to. Or you get smart. Let me get the 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 Let